In Luke 24, the last section that we're noting in his gospel, as we get uh, to wrapping it up, uh, is in verse 50 through 53, which is the narrative about the ascension of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And to read it, once again, it says, And he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came about that while he was blessing them, he departed from them. And they returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising God. So in regard to that, again, that is the narrative that Luke first gives in regard to the resurrect, or excuse me, the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But then as we know the parallel verses in Acts chapter 1 verses 9 through 11, he gives a little bit more detail in regard to this process of our Lord's ascension. And we note there that it does use that word ascended and he departed into the clouds. And there the two angels were said to the men that were watching, you know, why are you looking up? The way he, you saw him leave, he will return. So great encouragement there as well for the second coming of our Lord. But here we're talking about the ascension of our Lord uh, after his uh, resurrection and then being on earth for 40 days, as you know. Then 40 days after that resurrection, he ascended. Ten days later, he sent back his Holy Spirit on the Feast of Pentecost. So with that, we've been noting the doctrine of ascension, and we're going to continue that this morning. And also to remind you, when we talk about ascension, we talk about the reason for his ascent, ascension, and that was for his session to be seated at the right hand of the Father in glory and in exaltation. So as we talk about the ascension, as we get a little bit further into this, probably starting on Tuesday, we'll begin to talk about the session of our Lord, seated at the right hand of God the Father, and the importance of that. But before we get there, I want to give you a few more points and principles in regard to the ascension of our Lord. By way of definition, remember this is the doctrine of Christology, again Christology, the study of Christ, pertaining to the transfer of our Lord's humanity. Remember, he resurrected from the dead in true humanity, but in resurrection form, as we will have a resurrection body one day when we leave planet Earth, and then uh, we meet uh, the Lord in the clouds of the air at his second coming at the rapture of the church. So, again, we too will receive our final resurrection bodies at that point in time. But he's already in his resurrection body, which he received on that feast of first fruits when he rose from the dead. So it's the transfer of that resurrection body that Christ is now in and was in at that point in time, where he went through, again, not only our atmosphere, but the stellar universe, and then to the third heaven, as it's called, which we studied on Thursday this past week. Again, the third heaven, which is God's throne room, which is outside of our stellar universe. And again, it just blows the mind when you think about how big our stellar universe is and what we've been able to see of it thus far with the technology that we have. And yet God's throne room, the third heaven, is outside of that and outside of that realm. Absolutely mind-boggling when you think about it. But in any case, that's where Jesus Christ is, in the throne room of God at the third heaven, where also the temple or the tabernacle of heaven resides with all the various articles that were copied here on planet Earth. Jesus Christ now sits there at the right hand of the Father in great glory and also in great judgment as well, as we know. So in any case, that is what the study or the doctrine of ascension is when he transferred from planet Earth to that third heaven where now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, what I wanted to share with you today and begin with are the various prophecies that we saw in the Old Testament, both by word and by type. And that's what I'm going to give you this morning, by word and by type, the prophecies of the ascension of our Lord. And so we start in the book of Psalm, chapter 47. So let's turn there now in our Bibles. Let's go to the book of Psalm, chapter 47. If you have headings in uh, your Bible, uh, as I do with my Ryrie Study Bible, again, it, uh, in uh, chapter 47, it says, For the choir director, a psalm of the sons of Korah. So again, uh, they were great songwriters and leaders, uh, part of the Levitical priesthood. 
So as we jump down now into verse 7, okay, and you can read uh, more about uh, the rest of the psalm on your own, but in Psalm 47, uh, now in verse 5, let's go there in verse 5, it says, God has ascended with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a skillful psalm. God reigns over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people have assembled themselves as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God. He is highly exalted. So again, in that portion from verse 5 and then also in verse 8, we see not only the ascension, but also the session of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As our God has ascended with a shout the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. So again, he has ascended. And in order to ascend, he has to first do what? Descend, okay? So in order to have an ascension, you have to have a descension. He has to come down. And that's what we recognize and see. And we also, you know, uh, put it a little bit further than, you know, just to ascend to a throne, to put him on that throne. We could say that's an ascension all by itself, just being on the throne. But again, it points out the difference between verse 5, he has ascended, and then verse 8, he sits on that throne. Ascension so that he could be seated at the right hand of God the Father. So there we see a little bit understanding in regard to the ascension of our Lord and then also his session. Let's go to Psalm chapter 68. Psalm chapter 68, specifically in verse 18. And this is the Psalm of David. And there in verse uh, uh, 60, uh, six, uh, chapter 68, verse 18, it says, You have ascended on high. You have led captive your captives. You have received gifts among men, even among the rebellious also, that the Lord God may dwell there. So again, you have ascended on high. You have led captive uh, your captives or a host of captives. You have received gifts among men even among the rebellious also, that the Lord may dwell there. So again, uh, we see the recognition of the ascension of our Lord. You have ascended on high. So again, in order to ascend, there had to be a descending in order to be put in that position, now seated at the right hand of the Father. And what's important about this verse, which we're going to see a little bit later on, okay, this morning, but in Isaiah, excuse me, Psalm chapter 68, verse 18, this is also quoted in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and regarding the ascension of our Lord. So we know for sure that this verse absolutely talks about Jesus Christ and his ascension. All right, let's go to one more, which is now Proverbs chapter 30. So again, after the book of Psalms, you have Proverbs. And in chapter 30, and specifically in verse 4, All right, so in verse 4 it says, You, excuse me, who has ascended into heaven and descended? So again, we see kind of the ascended and descended. Who has gathered the wind in its fist? Who has wrapped the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name or his son's name? Surely you know. So again, even that, you see the little bit of emphasis about the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and the ascension along with the descension of our Lord. So with these verses, we see prophecies in regard to the ascension of our Lord that he absolutely fulfilled, as we know in the passages that we've already been noting. I'll remind you of those uh, in just a minute. But we see that there was prophecy in regard to that in word. We also see and recognize that the theophany of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ had a prefiguration of his own ascension. And that is found in the book of Judges and in chapter 13, specifically in verse 20. But I'm going to read more around that as we look at that this morning. And this is very interesting because this is the 
uh, storyline of Samson and really Samson's mother and father before they had given birth to him and then also at the birth of Samson. And there's a lot of great typology and analogy in this. It's a prefigure of our Lord's actual ascension. So let's turn there now in uh, the book of Judges. So again, let's go back. And again, after you go through the Pentateuch, again, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, then you get to Deuteronomy. Then you get the book of Joshua, then the book of Judges. Chapter 13. So in this, again, uh, you know, we all know the story about Samson, but we typically think of the storyline of Samson being Samson and Delilah, okay, when she had cut his hair. And again, his hair was, you know, the symbol of his strength, but the strength was really given to him by God, the Holy Spirit. And uh, as you know, she cut the hair and uh, he became weak. He was captured by the Philistines. And then he had that one last prayer and asked God for one last, uh, last act of strength. Whereas he was ch tied to the pillars in this great Colosseum with thousands of Philistines gathered around him. And he pulled the chains with that one last bit of strength. And the whole thing came tumbling down on him and the Philistines as well, wiping out many of them at that point in time. But that whole storyline begins with his birth narrative, which is a very interesting birth narrative. So let's go back to Judges, again, chapter 13. And uh, verses uh, 19 and 20 are specific, but um, let me start. Where do I want to start? I'll go back to verse 1. All right, so in verse 1 it says, Now the sons of Israel, again, did evil in the sight of the Lord, so that the Lord gave them into the hands of the Philistines forty years. And there was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had borne no children. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Behold, now you are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and give birth to a son. Now, therefore, be careful not to drink wine or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. For behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son, and no razor shall come upon his head. For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines." So again, we see no drink, no str uh, strong drink, and any unclean foods, and no razor shall touch his hair. So his hair will never be cut, because he will be a, quote, Nazarite. And that later on became something that's uh, what is called the Nazarite vow that various uh, uh, Jews and believers would keep from time to time. In fact, Paul did it for a little while as well. But it would basically be a vow where they would say to God, hey, uh, you know, I'll do X, Y, and Z if you want me to accomplish uh, you know, A or B over here. And so again, they would make this vow. They would not drink wine and they would do certain other things like fasting and things like that. And then ultimately, uh, you know, for God's will to be fulfilled through them. This is where it all began with that Nazarite vow. And so with Samson, again, who, who we'll see Samson coming forward, the child uh, from the wife of Manoah coming forward, we see this being enacted. And then he will begin to, what, deliver Israel from the hands of the Philistines. Now in verse 6, Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his appearance was like the appearance of an angel of God. Very awesome. And I did not ask him where he came from, nor did he tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and give birth to a son. And now you shall not drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. For the boy shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entered, or entreated the Lord and said, O Lord, please let the man of God whom you have sent come again to us. Or come to us again. That he may teach us what to do for the boy who is to be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah and the angel of God came again to the woman and as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. 
So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, Behold, the man who came the other day has appeared to me. Then Manoah arose and followed his wife. And when he came to the man, he said to him, Are you the man who spoke to the woman? And he said, I am. Notice that, I am. You know, probably Jesus Christ right there. All right. But in any case, verse 12. And Manoah said, Now, when your words come to pass, what shall the boy's mode of life and his vocation? Or what shall be the boy's mode of life and his vocation? So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Let the woman pay attention to all that I said. She should not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor drink wine or strong drink or any unclean thing. Let her observe all that I commanded. Then Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, well, Please, let us detain you so that you may prepare, or we may prepare a kid for you. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I will not eat your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. And again, the angel of the Lord is one of those, you know, theophanies, again, of Jesus Christ, where he presented himself in bodily form, okay? This time they thought he was looking like some kind of angel or an awesome angel, but yet it is the Lord Jesus Christ. Again, God in theophany. Now in verse 17, And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, What is your name? So that your words come to pass, we may honor you. But the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? Seeing it is wonderful. So there's another clue, okay? And again, going back to Isaiah, his name shall be called what? Wonderful, okay? A lot of clues here, all right? Not that I didn't even put in the notes, but you're seeing them as they come out. Now in verse 19, So Manoah took the kid with the grain offering and offered it on the rock to the Lord. And he performed wonders while Manoah and his wife looked on. That's kind of fascinating, too. What did he do? Again, we'll find out more about this. All kind of wonders, great things are going on. He's performing miracles, as it were. Now in verse 20, For it came about when the flame went up from the altar toward heaven, that the angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. Now in verse 21, Now the angel of the Lord appeared no more to Manoah or his wife, than Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord. Again, another name for Jesus Christ. So Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, for we have seen God. Notice that. This isn't any old angel, okay? You don't die if you just see any old angel. But again, it, as the law told them, if you see God, you would die. That's why in theophany they can see. But he said, we have seen God. So they knew that this was the Lord, or the angel of the Lord. We know that to be the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in verse 23, But his wife said to him, If the Lord had desired to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor would he have shown us all these things, nor would he have let us hear things like this at this time. Then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson. And the child grew up, and the Lord blessed him. And the Spirit of the Lord began to stir him in Manathadon between Zorah and Eshtaol. So again, that's the birth narrative of Samson. And what's fascinating about that is that the birth narrative of Samson is very similar to the birth mother of what? A uh, birth narrative of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, his mother, who had not given birth before, in this case she was barren, unable to, kind of like Elizabeth, again, uh, Mary's uh, cousin. But again, we see the birth narrative there. She was unable to conceive. God gave her the ability to conceive. So again, her birth was miraculous, just like Mary's was. Samson lived under the Nazarite vow, and as we noted in verse 7 as well, where did Jesus Christ come from? Jesus of Nazareth. So again, we see that analogy uh, uh, in this narrative. I already pointed out a couple of the others. The angel of the Lord, we have seen God. His name is wonderful. And then he said, I am. Again, all of these are giving us clues that this angel of the Lord was the Lord Jesus Christ, 
giving them that information. And then when he showed them all these wonderful things, we don't know what he showed them. Maybe he showed them what Samson would do in destroying the Philistines. Maybe he showed them what Jesus Christ would do as the type of what was going on with the son Samson. Again, who is a type of Christ, as we see in the Old Testament, uh, of Jesus Christ fulfilling when he was here on planet Earth. But what was also very fascinating about this is that when they had the sacrifice on the altar, the angel of the Lord did what? Ascended up in the flames. And remember, with the flames comes smoke. And we know that the smoke ascending up is also a soothing, pleasing aroma to God where he accepts that sacrifice when it goes up to him. So as Jesus Christ also ascended to be with the Father, going up to the clouds of the air, he ascended up after what? The sacrifice had been completed. After Jesus Christ had completed the sacrifice upon the cross, he rose to glory three days later. For some reason, he had to be here for 40 days, which we've talked about in the past, and giving the disciples that changeover period from him being in their presence constantly as their leader to now them being leaders going forward. Then after the 40-day time period, he ascended on high and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. So again, we see a lot of the similarities in the narrative and the story of Samson's birth and then the end of that scene with the angel of the Lord ascending in the flames of the fire after the sacrifice on the altar, we see the ascension of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ in type. And it gives us information about this ascension of our Lord. It's an indication that the sacrifice has been completed. The sacrifice of Jesus Christ was on the cross in the payment of the penalty for our sins. He won the strategic victory of the angelic conflict. Now that the victory was won, he could go home and be exalted and be seated at the right hand of God the Father. So again, we see that in the angel going up through the flames of the sacrifice that was upon the altar as accepted by God. And again, the angel of the Lord being a theophany of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So again, maybe when you think about Samson in the future, we won't just think about the Samson and Delilah story and the great strength that he had, okay? The, there's typology there as well about his strength through the Holy Spirit, et cetera, et cetera, and defeating the enemy. But it all started with this great narrative of the ascension of our Lord Jesus Christ after the sacrifice had been completed. The Nazarite, the Nazarite vow, the, uh, the, the miraculous birth, the virgin birth of Mary, all of these things, as I've pointed out, are great prophecies in regard to the coming of our Lord and then ultimately his ascension. So again, when we compare the narratives that we find in the book of Psalms and Proverbs and we compare it with that book of Judge, literal scene, we see the prophecies of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ ascending after his work on earth had been completed. Now at the same time, Jesus Christ also prophesied himself to Nicodemus that he would one day ascend. And we note that in the narrative of John chapter 3. And John chapter 3 is that great chapter where, again, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And then John 3.16, which everybody knows, even the unbeliever knows, believe in the Lord Jesus, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe upon him should not perish but have eternal life. Everybody knows that, even the unbeliever, okay? Because you see there are all the football games and all these other sporting events, they hold up John 3.16. But in John chapter 3, verse 13, Jesus Christ made his own prophecy in uh, in, in uh, not fulfillment as of yet, but in uh, support of all the Old Testament prophecies of his ascension. And as John, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven. And who is that? The Son of Man. The Son of Man. And again, remember that. That Son of Man is that great title that we see throughout the book of John. We saw it in the book of Luke as well as a representation of the Messiah, the Savior, the Anointed One who would come, the Son of David, but also the Son of Man going all the way back to a Adam and how he came in the likeness of Adam to be the sacrifice for our sins for all of mankind. 
but no one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And when he's saying this to Nicodemus, remember, you know, you must be born again. And then he says this, and then he gives the part about, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. So you see the narrative, and we recognize in the person of Jesus Christ, he is the one who needed to descend. And remember, no one has ascended except he who descended. You see, the one that came down from heaven, the one that came down and took on humanity through the virgin birth, coming forward in hypostatic union as the God-man. He who descended is also the one who has ascended into heaven. And that is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So in fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, in fulfillment of the typology of what we saw in the book of Judges regarding Samson, Jesus Christ is also saying, I must ascend and I will ascend. And this verse was also a great verse, not only for Dick Nicodemus, but for the believers of that day and for you and I as well. Because again, Jesus Christ is the one who ascended and they witnessed this. They witnessed this and they spoke about it as we're going to see uh, in the passages upcoming. Now, it's interesting in Luke chapter 9 in verse 51, the exaltation of Jesus Christ's victory upon the cross is the emphasis also when he came into Jerusalem for his Passion Week. And only Luke is the one that, uh, only one that mentions this and ultimately uses that word, ascension that the reason that he was going to enter into Jerusalem, and again, he could have said so that he could pay for our sins on the cross or that he could be the sacrifice. No, he came to Jerusalem so that he could ascend. And not just ascend up to the hill city called Jerusalem, but ultimately ascend to be with God the Father in the demonstration that the victory had been won. The sacrifice had been made on the altar of the cross. The victory over sin and Satan and death had been won. The strategic victory of the angelic conflict and the ascension now would follow. Recognizing that victory and the exaltation and glorification of our Lord Jesus Christ for the work that he accomplished for all of mankind. And now exalted to be seated at the right hand of the Father with great power and authority. And as I've said time and time again, Jesus Christ as God always had that power and authority, but now it's his humanity that is receiving that power and authority seated at the right hand of God the Father. God is everywhere. One of the things that we talk about the essence of God is that he's what? Infinite. He's eternal, which talks about time. Infinite talks about space. Okay, He's everywhere at the same time. And he's here, he's in the third heaven, he's throughout the entire universe. That is our God. But for a person to ascend, okay, had to be something different. Because God doesn't need to descend and ascend because he's everywhere at the same time. Okay? But yet the humanity of Christ came down. And the deity of, uh, of God filled that humanity. And then ultimately received that resurrection body and then now has ascended and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. So in Luke chapter 9, 51, as it says, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. Okay? And again, yes, we know that Jerusalem was the city set on upon a hill, and they always talked, even when they came from the north, they always said, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. You see, we would say, we'd go down to Jerusalem because you're going from the north to the south. You're going down there. Okay? But no, we're going up to Jerusalem. So it was always a thought of ascension. But again, the days, when the days were approaching for his ascension, he was determined to go to Jerusalem. It's a little bit more than just climbing the hills or the steps to get to Jerusalem, the place of his passion, where he would suffer and die for our sins. It goes beyond and gives the victory. So again, this is the victory cry. He didn't come just to die. He came so that he could ascend. And with the descent, ascension comes the session, the glorification the rule, the power and authority of our Lord, as George prayed this morning, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. So we've already noted the various passages that the fulfillment of the prophecies. Again, Luke 24, 51. And Luke there just says he departed. Okay? 
but we get the rest of the story when we compare Scripture with Scripture, seeing the prophecies of his ascension, Jesus' own words, and that was the departing. It wasn't like they went to Bethany and then he go, oh, I'm going back to Galilee, okay, or I'm going back to my hometown, Nazareth, okay? He departed, and then fortunately, the rest of the information is given to us in Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, and he departed up into the clouds. The ascension, he did go up. And he went up from there. And it's kind of interesting, too, when you think about it. You know, he came into Jerusalem on that Passion Week. Yes, he had to ascend to get to that city set upon a hill. But why didn't he ascend from there? You see, he took him down the Kidron Valley and then back up the Mount of Olives, or Olivet, and then went over a town or two from there to the place called Bethany. I showed you the map last week. And again, he was on another hill. He had already ascended in the physical sense. But now the ascension was, let's go to heaven. And that's when he translated from this earth, through our atmosphere, through the stellar universe, to the third heaven, which is called God's throne room. And now he is seated at the right hand of God the Father. As it tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 34, again, Peter, when he came out after being filled with the Holy Spirit because of the day of Pentecost and dwelling in baptism of the Holy Spirit, he then rushed out and started to witness the gospel. One of the things that he said in verse 34, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. What was he doing? Quoting Psalm chapter 110 in verse 1. And in regard to that, again, another prophecy being fulfilled, but in that case, specifically related to the session of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we see many prophecies of the Old Testament focused on the session of Jesus Christ, as we see New Testament uh, passages also regarding his session, being seated at the right hand of the Father in eternal glory. And in fact, there's a lot more said about that than there is the ascension itself, because that's where it really culminates. And now where he is seated at in heaven, in power and authority, in his resurrected humanity. And it's interesting, for it was not David who ascended into heaven, but he himself says. And, and Peter, and you can go back and read uh, Acts chapter 2 on your own as well, but Peter also said what? You know, but he's dead, he's no, he's no longer with us, and his grave is still here with us today. In other words, you could dig up his bones if you wanted to. He hasn't ascended, or excuse me, he hasn't resurrected, and certainly not ascended. His bones are still there. His tomb is still with us today. But it was not David, but our Lord who did ascend. And we go to his tomb, now it's empty. We can't find his bones. They're not there. Because it, they're now reconstituted in resurrection form. And now he ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father. So what we also recognize is that when we talk about the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Yes, that's talking about the session. But as I've said, to get to the session, you have to have the ascension. Because Jesus Christ, the one who descended, is the one who ascended and now is seated at the right hand of the Father. So we also uh, see the fulfillment of Psalm chapter 68, which I've already mentioned to you, in Ephesians chapter 4 in verses 7 through 10. Let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4 as we now look at New Testament fulfillment of our Lord's ascension, and then also we see the session. Now, this is an interesting uh, uh, chapter in uh, the book of Ephesians that Paul had written, and we've studied this from a number of different angles. Yes, we've talked about the resurrection and ascension of our Lord already. When uh, we talked about his resurrection at that point, and as I reminded you this past week, when he resurrected from the dead on that day of the Feast of Firstfruits, and Mary Magdalene met him and hugged him and was clinging to him, what did he say? Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. 
And we then know that Jesus Christ, what we're talking about in the narrative today, in the book of Acts and also at the end of Luke, is not that ascension. That happened 40 days later. But on that day, he said, stop clinging to me. I have not ascended to my father as of yet. And so as I told you and as we studied this past week, there are two ascensions of our Lord. One on the day of his resurrection where he had to present himself as the first fruit offerings. And something unique happened there as well that's found in this narrative. And then 40 days later, we have the ascension of our Lord in the, in, in, in when he left the disciples here on earth and went up through the clouds of the air and at that point was seated at the right hand of the Father. And so this narrative that we see in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 through 10 is a direct quote that we find from Psalm 68, 18 in regard to the ascension of our Lord. And two fantastic things happen that we're going to talk about as we go through this. Now, in verse 7, it says, But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, uh, Paul is actually writing this, first and foremost, to talk about spiritual gifts that God has given to us. And specifically in this chapter, the communication spiritual gifts, starting with the early church of apostles and prophets, which no longer are needed because we have the completed canon of scriptures, but then evangelists and pastor teachers. Okay? So we've studied that in regard to the pastor teacher, the communication gifts. We've studied it in regard to spiritual gifts. But in regard to the ascension of Jesus Christ, again, we are focusing on it today because this is another one of those passages that prove or speak to the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. Now in verse 8 it says, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. So a little bit different. When you go back to Psalms, it says he, he received gifts. This is now saying he gave gifts to men. Now in verse 9, now this expression, he ascended. What does it mean except that he also had descended into the lower parts of the earth? Something new there. He who descended is himself also he who ascended far above all the heavens, but he or that he might fill all things. And then the gifts again, and he gave some as apostles and prophets and as evangelists and some as pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the service, the building up of the body of Christ. So again, those early communication spiritual gifts of pastor, excuse me, of uh, apostle and prophets, and then also they had evangelists and pastor teachers back then. Now we only recognize uh, evangelists and pastor teachers because no longer do we need apostles and prophets because of the completed canon of Scripture. And that's another story for another day uh, in regard to the ceasing of certain spiritual gifts that were available in the early church. But in any case, the fulfillment is found here for us. Not only did Jesus Christ ascend through the first and second heavens arriving at the third, but he also, in this narrative, as we've seen, descended into the lower parts of the earth. So it's interesting. We know that Jesus Christ had to descend from heaven to come down to earth. That's one form of descension, as we see. But there's another one as well. And this gives us the narrative that not only did he just come to earth, but after his death upon the cross, what happened? He did go down into the lower parts of the earth. And what's in, inside the earth? What's inside the earth? Well, we've studied it out, and you should know these things. But that's where, oh, well, we get on the board, so you just look there, too. All right, Hades and Shield resides. Again, Hades, Shield, it's the same location. One's Hebrew, one's Greek, okay? But it's talking about the same location. And it's talking about the place where the Old Testament saints would go upon their death, whether they were a believer or an unbeliever. And in regard to that, again, I've shown you this picture in the past, but as we also recognize from Luke's account, okay, and we studied this in the Gospel of Luke already, and recognizing uh, when Lazarus had died and gone down in, in Luke chapter 16, when Lazarus had died, he went down into the place called Paradise, also called Abraham's bosom. 
And for Old Testament saints, when they would die, they would go to that place called paradise inside of earth that was part or one of the compartments of Hades slash Sheol. But the unbelievers, where would they go? To the place called torments where the rich man went and how he was in agony in that place. And in Luke chapter 16, we know the great gulf that divided the two so they couldn't cross from one to the other. But they could see and they could know what was happening on one side to the other somewhat. So what we recognize is from Scripture that Jesus Christ not only descended from heaven and came to earth upon the virgin birth, but he also, after the cross, went down into this place called Hades or Shield inside of planet Earth. And as we know from Scripture, there are four different compartments inside of planet Earth. And the first one is that place called Hades, okay, Sheol, where in the Old Testament all believers and unbelievers went to that location, but yet the two separate compartments, one for believer, one for unbeliever. What we recognize is that the believer compartment has now been removed and is now in heaven with God and our Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to come back to that in just a minute. But today, when an unbeliever dies, that's where they go. They go down into the earth, not only the grave, but down deep inside to the center of our earth, where God has created this compartment as a holding place. Some people call this hell today. Then there are other compartments that we also see in Scripture, one called Tartarus, which is a prison for uh, demonic uh, angels who cohabitated with women during Genesis 6. We see that in 1st, 2nd Peter in the book of Jude. I'm not going to study this. We've done this in detail. Another doctrine for another day. Then there's the abyss of the bottomless pit that was mentioned in the Gospel of Luke, which we studied. And then also in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 12, where we see pe uh, these demons coming up from the abyss during the tribulational time period. And then the fourth compartment is uh, there's a place called the Euphrates River, which exists today. But there's a compartment under it that is a holding place for certain demonic angels as well that too will be loosed in Revelation chapter 9, verse 13 through 21 during the tribulation. So again, we see the four different compartments. Three of them are for the fallen angels who aren't loose. And as you know, many of the fallen angels are loose today as Satan is. But when they broke other laws of God after their rebellion, they would be put away and locked away in these uh, different locations, either until the tribulation or, secondly, the great white throne judgment seat of Jesus Christ, where all of this gets cast into the eternal lake of fire. But for members of the human race, there's only that one place called Hades, okay? And that's where they're held today, or shield. Uh, if, if you like that word. So what did Jesus Christ do? Well, as you know, he had a trichotomous separation, body, soul, and spirit. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit, one of the seven sayings. His spirit went to heaven upon his death on the cross. The body they carried away into the tomb, it was buried there. Where did his soul go? Down into Hades. And this is one of those passages where we know that he went down into that place called Hades, the lower parts of the earth. And then with other scriptures, we know the, the, about the trichotomous separation, his soul going down there like the believers and unbelievers of old. Because remember, when unbelievers die, what do they have remaining? They don't have a spirit. The body stays here on earth. The soul is what goes down there. And Jesus Christ emulated that, and his soul went down into that place and he proclaimed victory. He proclaimed victory that he just won at the cross by paying for their sins and ours. And reiterated their rejection of the Messiah, God's plan of their, for salvation, God's plan to forgive their sins. And he proclaimed that victory. And as he did that, what he also did was take host, the captive of hosts. He took that unbelief, excuse me, the believing compartment called Abraham's bosom or paradise, and he brought that up into heaven with him.
and now those believers are in heaven with God. As now we die during the church age, we don't go down into Hades any longer. The believer goes directly to heaven and is now, as Paul said, face to face with the Lord. Face to face with the Lord in heaven. So again, Jesus Christ, as it says in Ephesians uh, chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led captive a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Now, I'm running short on time, and I want to get to communion, so I'll just give you, there's so much more I wanted to give you this morning, too. And there's a whole bit about Satan counterfeiting the ascension of Jesus, which we'll talk about on Tuesday, okay? Hoping to get that in today. But the last aspect of this is that he took them and brought them to heaven. And ultimately, uh, Jesus Christ, when he ascended, he brought them at that time, as it says in Ephesians chapter 4. And we're going to come back on Tuesday. We'll study out the detail because there's two things that happen here. He, is, he led captive the host of captives upon his ascension, and then he gave gifts to men. And just real briefly, I'll give you the detail. You've already got it in your notes, but I'll talk about it more on Tuesday. Gifts weren't given, spiritual gifts weren't given until what? The day of Pentecost, when he sent his Holy Spirit back. Because gifts are given to us by the Holy Spirit. But when he ascended on high, and he led captive the host of captives, we don't see anything corroborating that narrative in the ascension of Jesus 40 days after his resurrection. But we do see a first ascension. Mary, stop clinging to me, I have not ascended to my father. And at that point, he ascended on high. And at that point, his soul was reunited with the body. The spirit came back from heaven and joined that body. Jesus raised that body, came forth from the tomb, and then took trichotomous body, soul, and spirit, and he ascended to God and presented the first fruits resurrection. What else happened during that time? Well, Matthew records... And he records it in an interesting way, but then comes back and gives you the detail. When Jesus Christ rose from the dead, it gives it in the cross narrative. It makes it seem like the signs and miracles and wonders that happened when, when he died, and the earthquake and the darkening and all that stuff. But he also says and the tombs were open and people came forth. But then late, right after that, he says, at the resurrection of Jesus. So when Jesus was raised, people came out of the tombs. Some of those people that were in uh, Hades, in the place called Paradise, came back to physical life. And they had to live again on planet Earth until they died again. Others, the rest of them, went directly to heaven. And those who had to live a little bit longer as a witness for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and really uh, that Hades and hell exists, they too had to physically die. But then upon that death, they would go directly to heaven because now as the first fruits could rise into heaven and ascended into heaven, now all other believers could go there. And then one day we'll receive their final resurrection bodies. So again, we see the great narrative of the ascension of our Lord in the two events that I just gave to you, but we'll come back on Tuesday and we'll go through this in a little bit more detail with a little bit more scripture and understand the two great miracles that Jesus Christ performed upon his ascension. And then I'll just tell you, one happened at the first ascension, and the second happened at the second ascension. Especially, and the second one being the gifts, communication gifts that he gave to men. All right, so we'll pause there, and we'll uh, come back on Tuesday and get more about the ascension of our Lord. All right, Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for helping us to understand our Lord's ascension in even more detail. But again, not just knowing the events and the historical nature of it, understanding the importance of what it means to us in the spiritual life that we have and also the high priest that sits upon the throne who is looking out for us as our mediator each and every day and father we just can't thank you enough for what jesus has done for us the being the first fruits and the demonstration and the type of what we too will receive we thank you father and we ask that you help us to live in that knowledge without fear worry or an anxiety in this world knowing that we too will be raised to glory one day as our Lord already is. And Father, we thank you for this time of celebration in regard to our Lord's resurrection and ascension. And we ask that you lead us now as we celebrate communion in Christ's name. Amen.